such a good chapter, Revelation 19. All of God's word is good, don't get me wrong. But this word gives news about some great things that are coming up. And I love this going through this chapter. So I want to make sure we get through everything. I'm probably not going to ask a lot of questions through the teaching, but I'll try to leave time at the end for insights or questions or, or something you want to add to this. And I, I want to encourage that, especially at the end, um, insights or uh, questions you may have. I know many of you spend time reading the chapter beforehand. Such a helpful thing and marinating in it and studying it. And so uh, let me open us up in prayer and we're going to just jump right on here in Revelation 19. Let's pray together. Father, I am so thankful this morning for your faithfulness. Lord, um, even outside this beautiful day, it's a reminder that um, it's easier for us to acknowledge your, your faithfulness on sometimes on sunshine than it, than it is when it's raining. But you're faithful through the sunshine and the rain, through the, the, the beautiful temperature or through the high and cold, you're still faithful. And the same is true, Lord, in life, on the mountains and, or valleys that we experience in life. You are still faithful. I'm grateful, Lord, that our, our um, peace does not come from a lack of storms around us but lord our peace comes from christ who is within us and so lord when your word says that we can trust in you because you're faithful and you're always with us thank you for your your the way that you are always with us whether or not we can sense your presence you're still there it doesn't depend your presence does not depend on me it depends on you and your character and you are faithful so lord i know you're there and I pray for us today that as we walk through your word, may your spirit have full liberty in our hearts to, um, to call us to you, to convict us of truth and righteousness and of judgment. And Lord, may, if there's any area in our lives that are hindering us from knowing the full fellowship of, of, of Almighty God, Lord, would your spirit speak to us that and um, come before you with all that we are. Thank you for the grace we know in Jesus. And it's in his name I pray. Amen. Revelation 19. There is a, a guide that I'll kind of walk through, and you'll see how like, almost like a bunch of little lists in there. There's some things we're going to walk through in this passage today. Um, and I made a list to make it a little bit easier to, to organize thoughts uh, for you and especially for me, but for, maybe for you too. We just finished up uh, Revelation 17 and 18, and now we're in Revelation 19. Remember, this is a kind of a three chapter section that has to do with the fall of Babylon that's coming up um, on a timeline for us that's in the future. That is going to be, that's going to be happening in 17 and 18. We saw judgments against religious Babylon, which is, is the false religion, and that was going to take place in the middle of the tribulation, but then the last half of the tribulation, the last three and a half periods, we saw the fall of the economic and political Babylon, the worldliness uh, the system of worldliness that's there, led by the Antichrist. And we saw the wickedness all through this book. We've seen the wickedness of the Antichrist and the influence of the Antichrist. And it's not going to be apparent to many. In fact, it's not going to be apparent to most, especially at the beginning of the tribulation. There are going to be many who fall or are swayed by um, the power that Satan has given the Antichrist during the time of tribulation until halfway through the judgment. Halfway through the judgment, he turns, he changes, he breaks his contract with Israel, his covenant with Israel. And so, and then he sets himself up um, as a false god. And all these things are, are before us. And this, the revelation, this, um, John is seeing this. God has given John this revelation of things to come. Every bit of this points to somebody, though. Who is it this points to? You can say it. Jesus, yeah, every bit of this. This is a revelation of Jesus, and it's going to, we're going to see this begin to um, enter into the culmination of this today when we see the return of Christ. I love this at the end of Revelation 19 where we begin to see that Jesus is returning. So in Revelation, in Revelation 19 and, um, and 20, actually, we're going to see five big events, a big turn of events. Today, we'll see the first two of five. Today, we're going to see that heaven will rejoice we're going to see that played out in the first half of this passage we read today. Heaven will rejoice. In the second half, we're going to see that Christ will return. I've got that on your guide in the top section and the bottom section of your guide. Heaven will rejoice and Christ will return. That's the two primary themes of this particular chapter. 
Um, the others that we'll see coming up in Revelation 20, there will be saints. The saints will, re, um, the saints will reign. That sounds funny, doesn't it? Well, I thought Jesus reigned. Well, he is going to reign, but he reigns with the saints. The saints are going to reign with him. Satan will revolt. We'll see that. And then sinners are recompensed. Um, that there will be rewards that are received for their faithfulness in Christ, the works they do by faith. So today, um, I was sitting here when I was studying. I, <laughs> in my study, and all of a sudden, these little background, did your mind ever come up with like songs based on what you're doing at the moment? Like song, not, not, in, not um, invent songs, but theme music just kind of starts popping. I'll just go ahead and tell you. So I'm reading in Revelation 19, and the next thing I know in the back of my mind, I hear the theme from Rocky music. And you'll know why here in just a second. Anybody ever seen the movie Rocky? What's it about? Yeah, boxer, Rocky Balboa, right? And so um, I don't know if you, I've watched them all over the years. Rocky IV is my favorite. Rocky IV is when he fought the Russian. Did did y'all see that? Oh my goodness, it's worth watching. Because this Russian in this movie, this is years ago when they made this movie, this Russian, here's, here's Sylvester Stallone or Rocky Balboa, and here's this Russian, and he's just this massive mountain of a man, and he's unbeatable. He just beats everybody um, boxing, and, and it seems like at will and at ease. Of course, uh, Rocky fights him. Guess what happens? Rocky loses. But then there's a rematch in Russia. And so Rocky goes to Russia to fight this Russian. And at the very end, they go all 15 rounds. And, I mean, it's like slow motion. Pow, pow. And at the very end, Rock, it's a spoiler alert. Are you okay if I give you a spoiler alert? Rocky defeats him at the very end. At the last minute of the 15th round, Rocky ends up defeating the Russian. And, um, and so when, when he did this, it was, it was a turn at the end of this movie that oh, he, Rocky's getting ready to get beat. He's getting, getting ready to get beat. Wait, he just got a good punch in. Wait, he, well, look at him. He's making a turn. He comes and wins. If you had never seen the movie, and you and I went to go see this movie, and we're watching, we're watching Rocky's now in Russia, and they're starting to fight, and Rocky's, you know, Rocky's getting whooped, and it comes to round 15, and I leaned over to you, and I said... Rocky's, here's where Rocky wins. Because I had seen the movie before. You hadn't. I said, here's where Rocky wins. Ivan Drago is the Russian dude's name. Like, Ivan, Ivan, he's going down. You know, if I told you that, you've not seen it yet. I'm telling you what I already know is going to happen. As if it's already happened. You've not seen it yet. And so, I'm, but I'm speaking as uh, of, of this event as if it's already happened. Rocky, he's won. He's won. Ivan's going down. He's, he's, he's already lost this fight. It's over right now. And, and so for when we read in Revelation 19, it's kind of that same way. We see things that on our human timeline have not happened yet. But John is being shown by God through the angels of what is coming up, what's going to take place. And what we see today, when we even read that Babylon has fallen, last, last chapter, Babylon has fallen, or today that, that um, the Antichrist has fallen, that Christ has returned, that we're seeing something that is going to happen. For us on a timeline, it's in the future. Timeline, it's in the future. But it's as if it's already happened the way this is um, revealed to us. And so we're going to see that in this passage today. Let's begin right here with Heaven Will Rejoice. Um, in, on your page, you see Heaven Will Rejoice. There's five songs, and I wish I'd put little quote marks there. It's almost like five spoken words, but there's five songs that we see here at the beginning of Revelation 19. And you're going to see this as we read um, let's look at let's look at what happens here in verse one. John says, "After this, I heard something like the loud voice of a vast multitude in heaven, saying, Hallelujah." Now I got to stop right there. I won't stop so much through the whole book. I, I mean, this whole chapter, I tell you, but I do have to stop right here because now my song switched from the theme from Rocky to. The hallelujah chorus. Now I know you've heard the hallelujah chorus, right? It is a it is a powerful song, and the most prominent word in hallelujah chorus is hallelujah. It should be. Um, here it is in this passage. But what in the world is hallelujah? Hallelujah comes from two words. I have it on your guide as well. It's, these are Hebrew words: halal and yah. 
And there's a Greek word that's made from those two Hebrew words, and that's what we know as hallelujah. And it literally means, halal means praise. Yah is a short name for Yahweh, which is God. So hallelujah comes from praise God. And that's literally what that means. Hallelujah means praise God. And this is, a, this is what John hears coming from heaven, as we just saw. So let me start back over. We're hearing him say, praise God. After this, I heard something like the loud voice of a vast multitude in heaven saying, hallelujah, praise God. Um, hallelujah, salvation, glory, and power belong to our God. Because, this is the first song, actually. Because his judgments are true and righteous, because he has judged the notorious prostitute, which we talked about, we'll talk about it again in a second, the notorious prostitute who corrupted the earth with her sexual immorality, and he has avenged the blood of his servants that was on her hands. So the, there's a voice, a song that comes from heaven, a song or a spoken word that comes from heaven saying, praise the Lord, he has defeated, and he's speaking of the, the false religion of Babylon that's identified as a prostitute. It's a false religion that many have been influenced by, this, this harlot or this, this prostitute, which is really the false religion of Babylon. And, and so this, as you know, this, um, the false religion deceived many, and um, the false religion deceived many by pointing to the Antichrist. The false religion, this harlot, pointed to, to the beast, Antichrist, um, and influenced many to worship um, the, the Antichrist. It's almost as if um, the harlot was, was really the, the wingman. The false prophet was the wingman to the Antichrist, pointing to, to <coughs> false worship. And so right here we see, hallelujah, God has defeated. God has brought judgment against the false prophet. And then there's a second song here, verse 3. It says, a second time they said, hallelujah, praise God. Her smoke ascends forever and ever. There's praise here because... The destruction of this false religious system is complete. It's devastated. It will never come back. There, when it says the smoke is forever and ever, it's saying never will it quit smoking and be alive again. It is defeated. It's gone. And I believe this also refers to the political and economic Babylon as well. She's done and left smoldering in her destruction. There's a third song right here, verse 4. Then the 24 elders and the four living creatures that if you remember uh, from an earlier study in, Re in um, Revelation, there were 24 elders representing the church or, or, or leaders in the church, and there's four living creatures. These are angelic. It says, They fell down and worshiped God who was seated on the throne, saying, Amen. Hallelujah. They're saying, Praise the Lord. They are echo, echoing the praise of everything that's already been said because of what's already been done. And there's a fourth song, verse 5. A voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all his servants, and the ones who fear him, both small and great. This praise came from the throne. I believe this is an angel. And it's saying, praise God, who invites everyone to praise the Lord. This, this praise leaves no one out, whether you're great, whether you're small. Um, everybody who fears him, that's every child of God, everyone that knows Christ, is, is encouraged or invited to praise the Lord. All who serve him, praise the Lord. And then in verse 6, it says, Then I heard something like the voice of a vast, excuse me, a vast multitude, like the sound of cascading waters, and like the rumbling of loud thunder, saying, Hallelujah, because the Lord God, the Almighty, reigns. This thunderous voice joined in the chorus and said, Hallelujah, our God, the Almighty, He reigns. So what does it mean that God reigns? This is R-E-I-G-N-S, right? Not R-A-I-N-S. Uh, what, what, what does it mean that God reigns? Does that mean that he's finally reigning, that he was not reigning, and now he's finally reigning? He's finally in control? Reigns means in control. Um, but certainly God is in control. But there has been a season from the beginning, or after the beginning, when Adam, actually before Adam and Eve fell, what Satan was allowed to come and have dominion over the earth. He still does at this point. He's been allowed to have dominion over the earth. So God is in control. Satan is given dominion, but there's a day that's coming that God is coming and taking that leash that he's got Satan on and jerking Satan back in and saying, no longer do you have any dominion on this earth. I'll tell you, Christ defeated Satan on the cross. He is a defeated enemy of God. Does he still work today? 
Absolutely. He's still at work. But Satan cannot do what God won't allow him to do. Satan can't go further than what God allows him. Job is a great example of that. Uh, the book of Job and what happened with Job there. God, it does, it does not mean that God has not reigned on earth. He let Satan have dominion. But now God, at this time, God will begin to reign again on earth fully as he judges Babylon, as he judges the Antichrist, and as he judges Satan himself. There is one more song. Actually, we thought we got there with the last one. Those two kind of make up the fourth song. Here's the fifth one. Verse 7, let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory because, I love this, because the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has prepared herself. She was given fine linen to wear, bright and pure, for the fine linen represents the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, to John, in verse 9, write, Blessed are those invited to the marriage feast of the Lamb. He also said to me, these words of God are true. And then I fell at his feet to worship him. Interesting. John fell at the feet of the angel to <laughs> worship him. But he said to me, don't, don't, don't do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers and sisters who hold firmly to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. Because the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. He's saying, I'm not the one to worship. Don't worship me. Worship God. So I've got a couple of questions here. One is, why all the rejoicing? And all these songs, why all the rejoicing? Well, in verse 18, we were commanded to rejoice, for one thing. At the judgment that was coming, we were commanded in verse 20 of 18, it says, rejoice over her, heaven and you saints and apostles and prophets, because God has pronounced on her, Babylon, the judgment that she had passed on you. And so God tells us to rejoice. He's judged Babylon, and he's avenged believers over Babylon. Believers, you know, we're not to rejoice over lost people losing their lives and going into eternity separated from God. That's not why we rejoice. That is, that is heart-wrenching, to understand that someone has left this world rejecting Christ and spent eternity separated from Christ in a place that the Bible describes as eternal torment. There's never rejoicing over that lost soul. But we do rejoice over the righteous judgment of God against sin. A righteous judgment of, of God against the, the, the flesh and the enemy and, um, and the worldliness that's here. That's why there's rejoicing. And God has passed judgment in his righteousness. And so we have reasons to celebrate. He judges enemies. He is reigning. And the, and the bride is ready. That's reason to celebrate. If they do, I don't know it. That's a good question. Does it say which particular angel speaking at this time? Does your translation identify that? Yeah. I'm not sure. I know there were, so, there were different angels that released the, the judgments, but I don't know which one this is. It's just... Don't worship me, you know. And, oh, and, right. And I was wondering, was it Michael? You know, because he was the defender. Of Israel. Yeah. It may, it may be. Hmm, that's a good question. In fact, I'm going to write that down. But um, none, of the, none of the Bible commentators that I've been studying with identified who they thought that might be and why. Okay. That's a good question. Who is angel? Don't worship me. Um, I'm going to jump ahead of my notes here because there's something I want to pull out. and I'm, I thought I put it in my notes here. Yeah, I'm going to jump ahead here just for a second about this angel since we're talking about this. that The fact that John fell down at this angel of worship, you're thinking, how, how can John, who walked with Jesus, saw him crucified, how, how is it that he fell at an angel to worship him? And I, you know, I want to encourage, be a little easy on John, <laughs> just for the moment, because just imagine all that he has been through. Here is he's in exile on the island of Patmos now. And there at one time, he was actually... Um, sought, they sought to execute him by throwing him in a, in a pot of burning oil and, and miraculously he lived and so he's in exile on this island and here he is experiencing something that he's no one has experienced like this as the, he's given the revelation of God 
And so I can't even imagine that the words we read come close to what he's seeing. They're in the direction of it, but he's trying to use human words to describe what's happening in the supernatural realm as God reveals all that's coming forth to him. And, and when he sees the, um, the glory of God coming through this, I don't know if it's just a quick emotional response or I'm overwhelmed and fell down to, to worship this angel, even the messenger of all this glorious news. But the angel is the more important part here when he says, don't worship me. <laughs> I'm a fellow servant. I'm, I'm like you. And y'all, we're not angels and we don't become angels when we die. Some people have that kind of thought, oh, they're an angel now. No, no, they're not. Jesus died for you, for humanity. That's the one thing that humans have is that we know what it means to be redeemed. In Christ, we have the redemption of Jesus. Um, and so we don't become angels. We're redeemed. We're the bride of Christ when we come. In the church age, the church is the bride of Christ. But I love that the angel said, don't worship me. I'm, I'm a servant of God like you are. But then said, worship God. And that's very interesting because in Scripture, we're told not to worship man. We're not told not to worship creation. Angels are created. God's not created. Jesus is not created. He's creator. Now, not every religion believes that. But the Bible teaches that, that Jesus is created. It says there's not a thing that was created that he didn't create. He is the creator. And Jesus did not refuse the worship of man. When people sought to worship Jesus, he did not say, don't worship me. The angel said that, rightly, but Jesus didn't say that. So what does that say about Jesus? When people say, Jesus never claimed to be divinity. Well, he actually received the worship of people who were worshiping God. He received it and did not rebuke them because it was right to worship Jesus. It is our relationship with him. We, ha we are to worship Jesus. And even when he walked here on earth, there were times when someone would worship him or and when he returned even um or ascent you know when he rose from the dead he didn't rebuke he didn't rebuke them and so we are we are right never to worship creation and this angel pointed john in this moment um this angel pointed john don't worship me uh, worship god all right let's continue on here um i will do one i have three reasons for celebration that's in the middle of your page here the third one is the bride is ready i kind of want to part there for a minute because that's what we saw in this last song that the bride this thing about the bride of christ we are the bride of christ is the church the bride of jesus is the church the bride of jesus began when the church began in acts at the day of pentecost that's the birth of the church and the bride of jesus is everyone who came to know christ from that moment on, and, and still today, when you today come to know Jesus, you are a part of the bride of Christ. Now, there, I believe there's a day coming when the church is going to be taken up out of this world, and, and what we've talked about is the rapture, and the church will no longer be here on earth. There will still be, will still be people who come to know Christ here on earth, but I believe the church is going to be with Jesus um, in heaven. And so the, I believe when he's talking about the bride of Christ that he's, ta he's specifically talking about everyone that came to know Christ from the moment the birth church was born until the moment the church is taken up um, to, to heaven to be with the Lord at the rapture. What is this bride? Well, Ephesians 5, 22. Um, I'm, I, didn't, I didn't put this on a slide, so don't worry about trying to put this on a slide. I'm just going to read this out loud. Ephesians, Ephesians 5, 22 through 27. I've, I've got the reference there on your page. Listen to this. It's going to be a passage that's familiar. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. This is what Paul is saying to the church in Ephesus. Because the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. He's the Savior of the body. I want you to hear more about Jesus than anyone else in this passage. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so, are, so also wives are to submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives. Here it is. Husbands, love your wives as Christ, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Jesus loved the church and gave his life for her. Um, why? Well, in verse 26, it says, to make her holy, cleansing her with the washing of, the water, of water by the word. Verse 27, he did this to present the church to himself, the bride to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or anything like that, but holy and blameless. That's why Jesus died for his bride, 
that they would come to know him and be presented as holy and spotless, not on their own, but as his, as his righteousness. We know about his righteousness that's imputed to the account of everyone who trusts in Jesus by faith. When God sees us as Christians, when we come to know Jesus, he sees you and me as righteous, not self-righteous, as Jesus' righteous, the righteousness of Christ. And so that's why Jesus says here that he's, present, he's bringing a bride to himself. His heart is that his bride will be holy and pure. Um, that wedding that's coming up when Jesus comes for his bride, it's really all about the groom. In today's weddings, we seem to be all about the bride, <laughs> especially if you're planning one. Almost every groom that I have a chance to talk with in like premarital counseling that we do, Almost every groom, if I ask a question about the wedding, they immediately turn and look at their fiance. Like, how many people are y'all inviting? Ask her. You know, <laughs> what colors are going to be there? <laughs> ask her. You know, whatever. And so the, and it is. I know in our culture it seems to be that the bride and her family are the ones that are doing the brunt of the wedding preparation. In this, in this what we see here, though, this wedding that's coming, the bride is being invited, but it is about the bride. The bride is actually being brought, but it's about the groom. It's about, it's about Christ. Um, it's all about him. What was this bride wearing that we read about in Revelation? Well, um, in verse 8 it says she's given fine linen to wear, bright and pure. For the fine linen represents the righteous acts of the saints. There's this linen that represents the purity of, 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 of her works that are brought about by faith. Understand, I'm, I'm not saying that we're made righteous by our works. What scripture says is we're made righteous by Christ and that leads to works because of our faith. Because of our faith. Because of our salvation we work. Not for our salvation but from our salvation. That's what our, our works um, are for. They, um, they are from the Lord. Not to earn his favor but because of his favor. Ephesians 2.10, I have that reference in there too. Uh, Paul said we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus Four good works which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. So when we are his, we have works that he's already prepared for us to engage in because of our faith in Christ. And so those works are described here as fine linen to wear. It's not works like, look what you did. It's look what Christ has done in you. Look what Jesus has done. And so we're clothed by his righteousness, and this should be borne out in our lives. There is something here, though, I don't want us to miss. When I was reading this, and a couple of um, commentators really brought this out really well, and I, can't, I don't know if I'll do it justice, but two th uh, just over halfway down, you see Jewish wedding, three phases. When the Jewish people in this day would have read um, about what John was, was revealed to John about things that were to come, or even the, even the Gentiles, when they would have read and understood the Jewish tradition as it was taught, um, those Jewish weddings had three phases. Well, there's something significant about that, the three phases of a Jewish wedding, that has to do with the picture of Christ returning. And it's as, as clear as day when you start to see these three phases. So I've got the three phases there. Here's the three phases of a Jewish wedding in that day. Phase one, this is a marriage contract phase. A marriage contract phase. When did that start? Well, actually, this was arranged when the bride and groom, many times, when the bride and groom were still children. When the parents would make this arrangement, the parents of the little boy and the parents of the little girl, they would make a contract together. Hey, when our little boy and little girl grow up, they're going to be husband and wife. When I, was a, when I was a parent of younger children, I would have loved to have that privilege of choosing my, my child's spouse. And I, by the grace of God, he didn't have us do that in our culture. And by the grace of God, I am thankful because he chose wonderfully for me and my, my for my kids but when I stop and think about what I wanted my parents to have that that same privilege when I was a kid no no I'm so thankful my parents didn't choose my spouse to be because I know my dad I knew one little neighbor girl that he said Ron you ought to start, start seeing if she wants to go out with you sometimes like no dad that's not that's not mm -mm. we're friends there's never going to be anything more than that and dad you quit being creepy <laughs> but in this day, many times in the Jewish faith, the parents would choose the spouse for their kids. And so they were, they, there was a contract that was made between those parents. Now, when did the contract get ratified? When did the contract become official and valid? It became official and valid 
uh, when, when there was a dowry that was, that was paid. What's a dowry? Well, in this setting, a dowry was a payment ba made by the man. You may have heard it as a, a bride price. This was a, a payment that was made by the man or the man's family to the bride or to her family. That was a dowry. When that happened, at whatever age that was, that's when the marriage contract was then ratified. At that point, legally, the man and the woman, the bride and the groom, were legally married. In fact, um, that's a little confusing. The word that many of you use is betrothed, and I know you've heard that word. It's almost like our engagement. They were engaged. But it's even stronger than engagement. They were bound. They were betrothed. Kind of like, well, actually, exactly like Joseph and Mary. When, before Jesus was born, they were betrothed. And so that's in that marriage contract phase. And that betrothal would take place that when the dowry was paid. For the bridegroom of Christ, I mean, excuse me, for the bride of Christ, the church, the first phase was completed on earth when, when you placed your faith in Christ. He paid the price, by the way. He paid the price by shedding his blood on the cross. That's his dowry. He paid the price for you and for me. And when you and I enter into a faith relationship with Christ, that's when that contract, so to speak, that covenant is ratified for us. The Bible says, for many has received him, to them he gave the power to become the sons of God. So the moment that we trust in Christ, we know that we are in covenant relationship with him forever because of what he has done. Now we're still right now in the betrothal phase because there's another phase phase two of the wedding and here it says on your page it says the groom came for the bride that's what would happen so you got these two and under normal circumstances that's what would happen the bride and groom they're there um, there's a covenant the, the dowry has been paid and now they're in this but this um, legally married state being betrothed and then at some point the bride I mean the groom would unannounced go to the bride's house with his friends and he would receive his bride and take her back to his house. That's what would happen. He would come for his bride and take her back to, to his house. She knew it was going to happen at some point. Didn't know when, but he would do this unannounced, the groom would, and go and bring her back to his house for the, for the ceremony that was going to take place at his house. One day, Jesus is going to split the eastern sky. And he's going to come for his bride. And he's going to take his bride, the church, I believe, the church, what Scripture teaches, the church is going to be taken back to be with him at his house. We who are alive will be called up to be with him in the air. That's what Scripture teaches. The dead in Christ will rise first, and then the, the bride will, uh, at his coming, and then we who are called up or alive will be called up in the air, which is, if you need a Scripture reference, it's 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. I did not put that in here. should have. So I believe, and that's when the ceremony would take place. Well, that's not the end of the wedding because then there was a third phase. And that was a, I wrote in here, a big old marriage feast. There's a wedding feast of the lamb, right? Here, or, or for us, it's going to be the wedding feast of the lamb. There's a big wedding feast. Um, in biblical times, the father of the groom would host a massive wedding feast. It could go for days. But people are invited, guests are invited, and there's the bride, and there's the groom, and there's this ceremony that has taken place, and now they are married, and people would celebrate that. And that's as you, you can you remember when Jesus was at a wedding feast, and they ran out of wine, right? And he turned the water into wine. Weddings were such a big deal in that day. There was a great celebration. And so the same is going to be, be true for us. If the church is taken to Back with the Lord, he comes for his church, and there's going to be a wedding feast. Now, some say that the wedding feast of the Lamb, which we talk about, we read about in Scripture, takes place in heaven during the, cell, during the tribulation. Some say when the church is taken out, that that's taking place in heaven. Now, others say, other commentators say, no, it's going to take place when Jesus returns fully all the way, when Jesus, the second coming of Christ, when, not just when he's coming in the air, but when he comes to earth at his return at the end of this tribulation, that that's when the, the marriage feast or the wedding feast of the Lamb is going to take place. And some even say and it's going to take place for a thousand years, the millennial reign of Christ. I don't know when it's going to take place. I can guess, but I'm, I, don't, I don't know if I want to venture a guess. All I know is it's going to take place. 
there is going to be a celebration of the mayor, the union of Christ and his bride. And it's going to be like no other celebration. And you, if you know Jesus, you are a, the bride of Christ and you are going to be uh, a part of that no matter when it is. If, if it's in heaven at the rapture, if it's on earth at the millennial kingdom, you're going to be there if you know Jesus and you're going to be there as his bride. Now there is something in verse 9. He says, um, then he said to me, right, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage feast of the Lamb. He also said to me, these words of God are true. Well, who's going to be invited? I'm not talking about the bride. He's coming for his bride, but there's going to be those who are invited. Who, who are those going to be invited? There's a, little, there's a little verse back in John that I think kind of points to who are the guests to the wedding. In John 3, 28 through 30. John 3, 28 through 30. This is John the Baptist. And John the Baptist says this. He's speaking to those um, who, who kind of may have thought that John the Baptist was the Messiah. He said, John, John the Baptist says, You yourselves can testify that I said, I am not the Messiah, but I have been sent ahead of him. He who has the bride is the groom, but the groom's friend who stands by and listens for him rejoices greatly at the groom's voice. So this joy of mine is complete. He must increase I must decrease. Now, I believe, based on this, that there are going to be guests that are invited, and what John is saying here, it could very well be that the guests that are at this wedding are not, that they're, they're in heaven because of their faith. They're not a part of the bride of Christ because they, they had their faith in Christ before the church was born. It's the church that's the bride of Christ. So any Old Testament saint, any New Testament person that had faith in Christ before the church was born, I believe, make up the wedding guests at this great celebration of, of the marriage or the wedding between um, Jesus and his, his bride. I believe that's what that is. There will be Old Testament saints, there will be John the Baptist and others that followed Christ before the church was born, and they will make up the guests at this great celebration. Does that mean they're less of a, uh, of a resident of heaven? Of course not. They're less of a child of God? Of course not. Not at all. But I believe the church is the bride of Christ and the church was born at the day of Pentecost. And so for you and for me, if this is accurate, then that means that, you know, they're still, they're going to be there, but there are guests to come and to celebrate. And the Lord calls them blessed in verse 9. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage feast of the Lamb. Well, we talked about the angel worship, John worshiping there, starting to worship the angel. The angel corrected him. Um, and now let's move on right to this next part, um, at near, right near Christ's return. At the end of this tribulation period, we know the kings, just before this, at the end of the tribulation period, the kings of the nations will turn against the Antichrist. Here on earth, the kings of the nations will turn against the Antichrist, and they come to do war against the Antichrist. They're drawn to, the Arm, to Armageddon where they're going to do war against the Antichrist. And they gather in the valley of Armageddon. But when Jesus returns, which we're getting ready to read about, when he returns, then these human forces will join together with the Antichrist to fight against Jesus. They were coming against him, but now they're actually coming together. Now they're going to turn and fight against the, the, the Savior who has returned. But look what happens. Verses 11 through 16. John said, Then I saw heaven opened. And there was a white horse, and its rider is called Faithful and True. And with justice, he judges and makes war. I'll go ahead and tell you, this is Jesus that he's speaking of. And you'll see this really clearly. Um, but look at all these descriptive words of the conqueror Jesus that's coming. He says, um, his rider is called Faithful and True. And with justice, he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a fiery flame, and many crowns were on his head. He had a name written that no one knows except himself. That's interesting. He wore a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. The armies that were in heaven followed him on white horses with pure white linen. I believe this is you and me and every believer that came to know Christ and, and, and the church that was raptured will come with him. Um, it says the armies that were in heaven followed him on white horses with wearing pure white linen. A sharp sword came from his mouth 
so that he might strike the nations with it. He will rule them with an iron rod. His rule will stand, is what it's saying. He will also trample the winepress of the fierce anger of God, the Almighty. And he has a name written on his robe and on his thigh, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So I'm going to park right there for a minute. Heaven is open and Jesus will return. Did you know that the Bible prophesies that second coming of Christ? I read a little bit of what David Jeremiah was saying about this. And David Jeremiah says this. People are often surprised to learn that biblical references to the second coming of Christ outnumber his first coming by a ratio, a factor of eight to one. That there's eight times more in scripture about his second coming than about his first coming as a baby in Bethlehem. Bible, he said, Bible scholars have identified 1,845 different references to the second coming of Christ. In the Old Testament, 17 books reference Jesus' second coming in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, there's 27 books in the New Testament. 23 of the 27 books reference Jesus' second coming. In the New Testament alone, just the New Testament, seven out of ten chapters reference the second coming of Jesus. Jesus is coming. There should be no surprise that Jesus is coming. And John here gives us a glimpse of this return of Jesus when he comes back on this white horse, faithful and true, and with justice he comes. not going to be up in the air like and most of us think it is. It's going to be here on earth. God's going to bring heaven here on earth. And I, that was a revelation to me. I, mean, I was just like, oh. You know, <laughs> yeah. You know, all my imagining and stuff, you know, was, was different because when you speak of heaven, you look up, you know. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, and I, I hear what you're saying. We do. We look up when we talk about heaven and kind of point, yeah, one day we're going to be in heaven. But really, I'm talking... When we read scripture, we are, it is a different plane. It's a spiritual plane. But it is kind of where the Lord is bringing heaven. We're actually going to read more in, as we finish out these last three chapters of Revelation where he talks about a new heaven and a new earth. And his, a new Jerusalem is coming down to, to earth. Right. And, and David Jeremiah was summarizing the last few chapters of Revelation. And that's why he was talking about yeah, that. Yeah, it, was, it was interesting. I can tell you my eyes have been opened to a whole lot as we've walked through this together. Um, and it's, it's, it's wonderful. It's challenging. It's wonderful. Um, but that's a, good, that's a good point. That, you know, we, it's not some pie in the sky and we're going to be floating around like, you know, wispy, dusty um, ghosts. We're going to be a new body. We'll have, yep. We're going to have resurrection bodies that are made for eternity and the, resur- the um, new heaven, new earth are, are, are made for eternity. Yep. That's exactly right. That's good news. Titan. So we'll see. Um, Jesus comes forth on a white horse, and we will come with Jesus to the battle of Armageddon, but we won't have to fight. We're not coming to fight. He's the one that does the fighting. He does it with his word. But we're going to be one of the arm. We're going to be with him. I don't know if you've ever ridden a horse, but uh, you know, whether it's li- figuratively or some, um, literally, it says that the armies will be with him on their white horses as well, and we'll be with him because the conqueror is, is coming. Notice his names, faithful and true. This isn't just an adjective. These are names of Christ in this. His name is faithful and true. But there's also a mention he has a new name or he has a name that nobody knows. Have you ever discovered something about somebody that you never knew? Even You were super close to this person and then you discovered something about them that you never knew. Not, not necessarily something bad. I'm talking about something good or something, you know, that... Neither bad nor good. It's just something about them that you never knew. There's, there, we, our minds are finite, and we have so much about God's Word that tells us about who He is, but our, fan, our finite minds cannot fathom all of who Christ is. In fact, here it says He has a name that nobody knows. And, and, and so we're going we're gonna to be worshiping. We're going to know this Christ. And even the words that he tells us about his names here that we do know, faithful is true, and the word of God. Is it a surprise to you that Jesus is called the word of God here? shouldn't be. Because this same John, when he wrote the Gospel of John, says in the beginning of John, 
in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And he's speaking of Jesus. Because in verse 14 of that same chapter, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among man. He's speaking of Jesus. And here in this chapter, here his name is the Word of God. Jesus is the, is the special revelation of God. When we use words, we're trying to express something verbally um, that people can hear, or if we write, something that they can read, of what's taking place in here. We're expressing the idea that we have. Well, Jesus is the full expression of God. He is, he is God, but he's also the Word of God, which means he's the full expression of God, and he's a special revelation of God. There are some things when you walk out on a beautiful day, especially if you go out somewhere maybe that you don't see cars and trees and buildings, I mean cars and buildings, but you would just see just the creation of God, whether it's the ocean or a mountain or somewhere, somewhere you've never been, and it's just amazing the creation of the Lord. Or look up in the sky at night when the lights are all out and you see the universe. It points to the existence of God. It cries out that there is a God, but you don't know about Jesus. And Jesus is the revelation, the special revelation of God saying, here's what God is like. Here's who God is. General revelation points us to God. In fact, the Bible says that, that nobody can be without excuse because the creation is enough to say that there is a God. And when I seek to know that God by his spirit, I seek to know that God, I believe that God will send the word, the gospel, that I can respond to who Jesus is, whether through a missionary or through a dream. There's people now where the gospel is closed in their country. There can't be missionaries to come in, there can't be, and there may be no Christian around, but when someone sit, responds to the revelation, the general revelation that they have, and they seek to know the real, the true God, there have been Christians, or now Christians, people who have come to know Christ because the gospel is shared, God spoke to them in a dream and proclaimed Jesus in a dream. Oh, man, I wish I had more stories. I, I wish I could tell you about Patrick and Ponde, who was in this church 25 years ago. From somewhere um, in Africa, when he was in a he was in a country, synopsis. There was not a gospel witness in his community. He, but there was there was education starting to happen in his community, and there was writing that was beginning to happen in his community uh, for over years, I guess, but not the gospel. And he began to respond to the creation, Lord. I, I mean, God, I know you're there. Whoever you know, this being that must have created all this it couldn't have just happen. And he came back to his place of living, his abode, whatever that was, and he had b began to be educated in reading, and there was the gospel of John in his language. He has no idea how it got there. And I don't even know if it's the full book, but he started reading this gospel, and he responded and ended up trusting in Christ. And years later, started getting into where he left his town and met other folks who know this Jesus and he was here to go to seminary at that time, to go to seminary, to prepare himself to go back and to lead in his, his home country others to Christ. It's amazing. And lead church, plant a church in his country. That was 25 years ago. So I know the Lord works beyond uh, what we can see. And I'm very thankful that he has given us the special revelation in his son, Jesus Christ, who is the word, the living word of God. We have the written word of God, which is the Bible. We have the living word of God, which is, which is Jesus. There's a sharp sword, it says, coming out of his mouth. He might strike the nations with it. This is a dramatic way of referring, of referring to the power of his word. One commentator, Johnson, says, Christ conquers by the power of his word. He defeats with truth because he is his truth he will set up his kingdom defeat the enemy and set up his kingdom with the sword of the spirit which is his word the final section here is the con not the conqueror but the conquered those who are conquered and this will be the kings of the earth this will be the beast and the false prophet this will be also which we'll get to next week satan in the beginning of chapter 20. I'm not going to speak to him today, but let's just read beginning in verse 17 about those who are conquered. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he called out in a loud voice, saying to all the birds flying overhead, high overhead, Come, gather together for the great supper of God. We know about the wedding feast of the Lamb. Here's another meal, and it's the great supper of God. 
and he's speaking to the birds, which are vultures at this point, because something horrible is happening here in verse 18. So that, come birds, so that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of military commanders, the flesh of the mighty, the flesh of horses and of their riders, and the flesh of everyone, both free and slave, small and great. And then verse 19, he says, And then I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to wage war against the rider on this horse and against his army. Remember, they're all going to come join forces now and go against this, this Savior, this conqueror who's come. Verse 20 says, But the beast was taken prisoner, and along with it the false prophet who had performed the signs in its presence. He deceived those who accepted the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image with these signs. Both of them were thrown alive into the lake of fire that, would, that burns with sulfur. Very picturesque of, of, of the eternal damnation. And then verse 21, the rest were killed with a sword that came from the mouth of the rider on the horse. And these birds, all the birds ate their fill of their flesh. This supper of God is a terrible uh, result of the, the judgment of God against the enemies of God, Antichrist and the false prophet and Satan as well, which we'll read in the beginning of verse 20. And it's all the world, all those that rejected God, rejected Christ, and followed the beast, and followed the false uh, prophet forever, eternal, eternally separated from the Lord in a lake of fire. Now, Again, we have reason to celebrate, and it's not over anyone, any single person that's lost and enters into eternity, separated from Jesus. When we pull back and see who God is and see the power of God as he reveals himself in Christ, as he comes in judgment at his second coming. At his first coming, he came in humility, Jesus did. When he came as a baby, he came in humility to serve not to be served at that point, not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many is what Mark says. He came to point to Christ. This is who God is. It wasn't just to teach about Christ. He came to die in our place as God. He died in our place as a human and as God. But when he comes back again, he's not coming as a, 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 a meek and gentle uh, king. He's coming as a conquering king, a righteous and holy conquering. And Justice, real justice, not my definition of justice. God's definition of justice is going to take place where holiness will win. Christ will win with truth. And the enemies of God will, will be cast away um, for all eternity. Now, there is a time when there's a waiting period here we're going to see for Satan when he's set aside for a little while and he's actually going to be allowed after a thousand years to come back for a short period of time for a brief um, period of activity, but then he also is cast into the lake of fire. I have a couple of takeaways, and you may have some as well. Um, God's word says over and over that Jesus is coming again. Over and over from Old Testament to New, Jesus is coming again. And what God says will come to pass will come to pass. We know that's the case. The enemy is defeated. As a second takeaway. He is defeated. It's just a matter of time world, the flesh, worldliness itself, Satan, the Antichrist, the false prophet, they're all defeated. Now on a timeline, the Antichrist, the Antichrist has not come to power yet. He could be alive today and his time may be close to coming in power at the rapture of the church. It could have, you know, the church could be raptured today. But he's as good as defeated. Those seven years, as long as they're going to seem for dwellers here on earth, it's going to be like that before judgment comes, or if Jesus returns. The third takeaway I have is that Jesus is the Word of God, King of kings, the Lord of lords, and he's greater than our finite minds can imagine. And He is worthy because he is the Lamb who was slain. Jesus is worthy. So let me ask you, I know we've got a few minutes here just uh, before before we end, what are some takeaways that you have to add in your own studies or something from today? What's a, what's an application or a takeaway? And if you'll talk loud, the microphone might pick it up for people on video. I had a question. Um, before verse 
11, it says the heavenly warrior defeats the beast. Is that Jesus or is that... Um, yes, that is Jesus. Okay. The heavenly warrior defeats the beast. That's who defeats the beast is, is Jesus. That's a good question. Those, na those kings are coming thinking they're going to defeat the beast, but it's the one from heaven who comes to conquer, and that's, that's Jesus. Anyone else? That's a good question. Thanks for asking. Now, again, I, when, I, when I teach this, I teach what I think Scripture points to, but I'm holding this interpretation not with a firm grip saying there's no other interpretation that's right. What I'm saying is right. There's some things I, I can say is absolutely right from God's Word because God's Word is clear. When it comes to the how of things come about in the end of time, there's enough room. There can be various interpretations. Some people don't believe there's going to be a rapture. They believe the church is going to be called up at the moment Jesus comes back. That may be true. Or maybe that's what they call the rapture at that moment. They don't believe it's going to be a rapture before the tribulation. I believe it is going to be before the tribulation. I hope it is before the tribulation. But it doesn't mean that, well, you believe something different about the timing of this? Well, you must not be a spiritual or you must not be saved. Our salvation doesn't depend on what I believe about the timing of the things at the end. It's my faith in Jesus, and we know he's, he is true. I can't, I can't, I've got to hold that firmly, that truth, that Jesus is, is God, and he's the way, the truth, and the life. He's the only way to heaven. How do we know that they didn't have to go through a period of that early? We're seeing publicly satanic rituals being done in the form of entertainment. Yeah. Um, isn't he having his time on earth right now? He is. Um, he, he certainly has time right now. And I think according to what we see in Scripture is that until Jesus re returns to defeat Satan, at the, in my estimation, that's, that's when G the second coming of Christ, the beast is done away with, the false prophet's done away with, and G Satan is cast in, into chains basically for a thousand years. And then he's loosed, the Scripture says, which we'll see here in a couple of chapters, he's loosed for a short time. And it may be, what we think today, may be, um, it may be similar or it may be an amplica amplification of some of the things that we're seeing today for a short period of time at the end of that millennial kingdom before there's a final judgment of God against, against him. But um, you're right. You can tell today Satan's not done away with. <laughs> the influence that he has in the, in the world today is, is strong. But, it, but be reminded, there's no influence that he has that, has not, that God does not allow. Everything that he has is what God has allowed for ultimately for, for God's glory, not, not for Satan's. Sometimes it makes you just shake your head and say, how in the world? You know, and you hear people say, Maranatha, which means Jesus, you know, Lord, come. Come now. Um, because it's, it's kind of mind-boggling to see, not just in your lifetime, not just in my lifetime, the influence of the enemy, but in the last 10 years. It seems like there's a celebration of things that are, 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 are clearly of the enemy. There's, there's not just a toleration. There's a celebration of things that are, are just um, come, from, come from hell, come from the enemy. So that's, that's a good question. But there is, there is a time that's coming that Satan will be ultimately defeated. And I believe it's after that thousand-year reign. He's loosed for a brief period, and then he's ultimately defeated for all eternity. Good questions. Anything else? I don't want to cut y'all. Grabbing my prayer sheet. So our God is faithful, is he not? Aren't you glad? So thankful. And we can call on him for every one of our needs, every one of our cares. In Christ, we have everything that we need. So here's a list of folks to call on to intercede for um, this week. I'm going to mention a couple. And you may have some updates as well. First of all, I want to say um, thank you, actually, as a prayer request for me, a praise.